Okay, uh, thanks for joining this session. So our next session is about choosing cloud native technology for the journey to the multi-cloud. And thanks for joining this session once again, including the virtual audience as well. So quick introduce to myself. My name is Daniel Lo. I'm CNCF ambassador and then a lot of stuff in track chair and a track committee member in KubeCon. I'm so happy to be here to introduce now our great speaker, Dalina, from uh, Form 3 at technical evangelist. So please welcome our next great speaker. Hello everyone. Um, hi, I'm Adelina and today we'll be talking about Form 3's journey to multi-cloud, some of the technologies that we use and exactly how they fit together. It's my first time at KubeCon and my first time speaking on this amazing stage. <laughs> so, and I really appreciate that so many of you took the time to hear me. So Daniel already said that I'm a technology evangelist of Form 3, but I just wanted to, to give a shout out to our amazing engineering team who have done all of the great work that I, will pre that I have the honor to present to you today. Um, all right, so this talk will consist of a quick introduction of why we decided to go multi-cloud and what it actually means. I'll set the background and I'll show you our previous architecture. Um, and then I will introduce each of the technologies that have made uh, the multi-cloud transition possible. And in particular, it'll be Kubernetes, Cilium, NATS, and CockroachDB. And these are amazing cloud agnostic technologies that we'll be learning about today. All right, so let's begin. We've got a lot, a lot of ground to cover. First, I'd like to introduce exactly what Form 3 does. So Form 3 sits between our customers, which are financial institutions, and the external payments infrastructure that power interbank transactions. As you can imagine, banks don't directly integrate with each other. That would be a maintenance nightmare. Instead, when they um, process payments in between, between banks, they go through external payments infrastructure that um, actually define the standards um, that we use for interbank transactions. And we make our customers' lives easier because we take care of all of the securing of the actual payments processing, and then they integrate with our APIs. So a lot of the decisions that we make uh, when it comes to architecture and technologies come from some of the challenges that we face in the world of payments processing. First, we process a huge number, a huge number of transactions. So we have um, a large volume that comes from virtually an unlimited number of users. Next, we have reliability and durability. We cannot, we need to recover from outages without dropping or repeating transactions because if we drop transactions, then money disappears. And if we repeat it, then we invent it in thin air. So that's not really good, except, you know, hopefully if we gave you more money, you wouldn't be upset with us. And thirdly, there is quite a bit of maintenance. Uh, the external payments infrastructures that you saw, um, there's a few, um, a few kind of different payments. And they also update their external payment schemes, their endpoints. So it can be difficult for a, a client that has a, maybe a smaller engineering team to keep on top of these, all of these changes. And this is another thing that we um, are able to take care of. All right, so this is the architecture that we had before the multi-cloud project, and it's not the beginning architecture of Form 3, but it will be our starting point today. So we had, a, we had our payment services hosted in AWS, and our platform is written in Go. That's why you see the really cute gophers with their little stack there. Um, we used SQS and SNS fanout for our, uh, messaging. And our, we used Postgres hosted on RDS um, as our database. Then due to regulatory requirements for the FPS payment scheme, which stands for faster payment services, we have to host um, we have to process transactions on leased lines. And this is why we actually started with a hybrid architecture. We have two data centers hosted by our partners at Equinix. And this 
um, the, uh, the data centers used uh, are run on bare metal Kubernetes and again have payment services that are written in Go, um, use NAT streaming and CockroachDB as messaging and data. And then they were meshed with Cilium as well. So what the banking sector is regulated and it's, that is also one of the reasons why it was the last to move to the cloud. And as we take on more and more clients and we have to process an increasing number of transactions, neither our clients nor the, the regulator want us to be dependent on a particular cloud vendor. Instead, we wanted to give our clients the peace of mind and the flexibility to run on multi-cloud. And we, in particular, we wanted to treat the cloud as undifferentiated heavy lifting, allowing our clients to connect to whatever cloud vendor they wanted to. And then we would achieve high availability because then they could connect to whichever payment service that was either running or that they preferred. So going multi-cloud, obviously that's going to be really easy, right? Like what could possibly go wrong? Um, in fact, the team identified a large amount of challenges from the very beginning. And in particular, uh, networking and service discovery was expected to be the most difficult part of going to the multi-cloud. And we needed to, keep, uh, to continue keeping our latency down as our platform is strongly consistent. Of course, we could have opted to build our platform all over again on another cloud provider like GCP, for example, but that would be a very difficult and long project. Um, so we decided instead to move to cloud agnostic technologies, which, are, which is the story that I will be telling you today. Okay, so first off, the challenge of deployment and in particular, we wanted our teams to have the same de development and deployment experience regardless of what cloud they were running on and regardless of whether it was, it was the public or the private cloud. We needed to abstract away whether in which cloud you're running. So, you know, it didn't really matter what you were doing. And we also wanted to be able to not hinder them in any case, in, in any way. So deployment, sh the development and deployment should continue to happen at the same speed that they, that they were used to. So we decided to use Kubernetes and, you know, obviously Kubernetes is so well known that I won't, um, that I won't go into uh, actually presenting it to you. But it, um, it allows us, these are the, like the main three reasons why we decided to go with it. First off, it allows automation of deployment, scaling and management of even more most difficult applications. It is cloud agnostic and deploys workloads in any public or private cloud. And that would make us, that would tick the box of actually, I don't really care what cloud I'm running in. And with its operators and CRDs, it is extendable. So it's a really great system for us to use. So this is what we ended up doing. Like um, we, de we deploy our payment services across three cloud vendors, AWS, Azure, and GCP. And we decided to opt for the managed Kubernetes offering um, because that would allow us to offload a lot of the work and um, expertise that was needed to run the Kubernetes clusters. Um, of course, we could have used, we could have chosen to run, to have the cloud provider provision VMs and for us to run, but um, to run the Kubernetes clusters ourselves, but that actually would have been a lot more difficult and it can uh, require quite a bit of expertise. Um, so we, uh, from the very beginning, we, this is one of the things that our engineers always do, which is like to push as much responsibility to the, ex, to the specialists, if you can call them that, to the specialists that um, maintain the public cloud. And this allows us to, um, to use our engineering resources optimally and have our engineers do as much, uh, do what they do best. So we like to push as much responsibility to the public cloud vendor while avoiding lock-in as possible. 
So w this shows you a little bit an overview of our stacks and environments. We have multi-cloud stacks, as you can see on AWS, uh, GCP, and Azure, and then they the deployments go in in order from dev to test to production. And stacks are exact contain exactly the same services, except that they are ring fenced copies that allow our engineers to test their work end to end. Um, then we also have the possibility to run in bespoke accounts for you know data location and isolation requirements. And most importantly, it, this showcases the fact that we need to connect and manage many multi-cloud stacks, not just a couple. Okay, so now we've deployed some services. Um, so how do we connect them together, right? These are some of the requirements that we had from our cloud connectivity. We needed a very quick networking solution that would form the backbone of our entire multi-cloud architecture. Um, in, particularly, in particular, it should be resilient and fault tolerant and have automatic failover built into it. And the the latency should be kept down since we don't want we don't want the multi-cloud platform to have um, higher SLAs than before. Okay, so I'm going to now give you a quick introduction to Cilium. This is this is a 101 session, so I'd like to make sure that everyone is uh, to get is on the same page. So Cilium is built on the Linux kernel technology called eBPF, and what how, what it does is it deploys. Um, deploys an agent alongside your nodes and your servers and it provides all of the services that uh, all of the all of the functionality that you see on this diagram which i've taken from their documentation so it provides network policies services and load balancing and a whole bunch of metrics together with um with hubble and grafana so why did we choose cilium um Cilium runs, uh, provides network policies on level on levels three, four, and seven. So it allows it it gives us a way to restrict egress from our multi-cloud platform. It is cloud agnostic, so it provides connectivity, service discovery, and load balancing across the clouds, making it really easy for us to deploy it anywhere. And it has the inbuilt observability with Hubble, which was part, uh, written for Cilium in particular. Um, and we already use Prometheus and Grafana, so that's you know that was a great fit for our platform. So the way that we decided to do multi-cloud connectivity was to leverage the already existing connections that we had to our data centers. Um, our data centers had already highly available and tolerant connections to our cloud architecture, so we decided to to use that instead. So our edge, the, we allocate CIDR ranges to our clouds, and then the edge routers have very high-level routing built into them, so they are able to send the traffic to the correct cloud. On the cloud side, we have gateways that can then forward the traffic to the correct service. Um, and the cloud vendors provide native write, uh, routing with their Kubernetes CNIs. And Cilium uh, provides CNI chaining, so, it's able, so we're able to use Cilium together with the, with the, cloud, vendor, with the cloud vendor CNIs. Um, we, use ver we need to make sure, we make sure that the um, addresses of our, of our stacks don't overlap, but because we choose very wide CIDR ranges, then we have lots of room to grow. So this allows us to have a very low latency of connectivity between our clouds of only a couple of milliseconds. So Cilium also provides the ability to run uh, the multi-cloud solution using cluster mesh, but that's not something that we've built in. Um, you can read about the good folks at Cilium have done an, an excellent presentation about cluster mesh on their, on their blog, which I encourage you to read um, or watch um, and if you want to learn more about it. Um, we might decide to mesh our multi-cloud and our multi-cloud multi solution in the future, but right now it does not run in, in cluster mesh. Okay, so now we've deployed our services, we've connected them, and it's time to pass some information between between them. 
So we had some requirements for our messaging system. First, it should support multi-cloud because you know the whole thing that we're talking about is actually deploying to multi-cloud. Then it should be persistent because we, again, we don't want to lose messages and we need to ensure that they get delivered. And it needs to have good Go client support because our platform is written in Go. So enter NATS um, Jetstream. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to what NATS is, um, and then you, we will look into how we use it. So NATS Core NATS is very fast messaging technology, and it provides it, it provides very quick message delivery, but it doesn't provide any persistence guarantees. Um, on the other hand, NAT's Jetstream does provide exactly once message delivery, and it ha has inbuilt persistence and durability guarantees. So we decide we this is we are only using NAT's Jetstream. Um, messages are. Um, Messages, so in NATS, messages are organized into subjects, and then the stream defines the retention of, an, of a given subject. NATS servers are then deployed and they expose endpoints, and NATS clients can then go and connect to it and receive their messages either in push or pull mode. Um, if you if you choose for pull mode, then NATS will, will deliver your messages as quickly as it can. Uh, but if you decide to go for pull mode, then you can have on-demand message, uh, message consumption, and you are also able to patch them. So the reason we chose NATS Jetstream, as you remember from our um, initial architecture, we did have some, um, some in-house experience with using NATS Streaming, but we decided to use NATS Jetstream in the multi-cloud project because it has the push and pull clients that I was talking about, and it also supports wildcard subscriptions, uh, which is another really cool feature. It's cloud agnostic, open source, and written in Go, so obviously the Go client support was there. And it provides horizontal scalability as, as, as well as exactly one's message guarantees. So it is a very fast, um, very, very fast, very scalable solution that we decided to leverage in our multi-cloud platform. So this is what it looks like. We have... Um, the data centers run in one cluster. So remember that there's two data centers, not one, with one in the cloud for replication. And together they make one cluster, and then the multi-cloud makes it another cluster. The two clouds together form a NAT super cluster. Inside a cluster, a servers use gossip to, um, to use a gossip protocol um, to actually like send messages between each other. And then when you connect to the two clusters together with leaf nodes, uh, with the leaf node functionality, which you can read more about later, then it allows us to pass through traffic between clusters. And um, our NAT servers are deployed in Kubernetes because NAT also supports that natively. So this allows us to actually pass information between clouds very easily. So finally, we get to the database storage part and we can look at CockroachDB. We needed, we had some requirements for our database solution. It should of course support multi-cloud and if possible, it should have SQL compatibility. As we were running our previous solution in Postgres, it would be great if we could still use those kind of the same kind of patterns as opposed to like rewriting a whole bunch of code as well as going to multi-cloud. It should easily run in Kubernetes and of course it should be scalable. So what is CockroachDB? So Cockroach is a distributed database and you can write and read from any node. It organizes, it organizes data into ranges, which Cockroach then rebalances and partitions accordingly. A, each range is assigned a node that is the leaseholder and that node is in charge of coordinating reads and writes to, a particular, to the particular partition. Um, to the particular range, apologies. Um, and it is a distributed database that is strongly consistent and is asset compliant. 
So why did we choose it? First, the PostgreSQL, uh, PostgreSQL compatibility was huge. It was a huge uh, plus for us because it allows us to switch our workloads um, and uh, use the same kind of like data structures that we have from um, from using Postgres. And it's cloud agnostic and is able to run in Kubernetes across vendors, which again is, is great for us. Strongly consistent because it does it requires a quorum to write any to write data to ranges. So that was absolute that was great for us as well. Okay, so this is how our um, how our ranges are, how we organize Cockroach in the multi-cloud. We, um, our data is replicate, has a replication factor of three. So this is why, what I'm representing with the different colored nodes. Each, um, each range is replicated across each, uh, each cloud. Because we have very fast connectivity in between the clouds, then this allows us to actually uh, spread the ranges across clouds and then still have the strong consistency on each write. Um, yeah, and then furthermore, um, we the cockroach cockroach have been great for um, the actual for. So the cockroach Postgres dialect has been a really a, a really seamless experience for our engineers to use in the application. So when it comes to CAP theorem, CockroachDB is technically a CP system because it requires um, a quorum to write, and but we achieve availability with our multi-cloud setup and Cockroach's built-in self-healing, which rebalances nodes and catches them up once they've been disconnected. So if they've been disconnected and then connect again. The good folks at Cockroach have, have done a nice series about the CAP theorem and how it apl applies to CockroachDB, which you can, of course, look up as well. Um, it's a really cool series. Okay, so this brings us to the end of um, the exploration of our platform. Um, but we can leave you with three rules of thumb. So when it comes to, if you're, if you're thinking about going to, to multi-cloud, then we recommend that you test your services end-to-end -end with a variety of load types. This has been absolutely crucial for us, and we use Toxipro Toxi proxy to be able to test our services in a variety of like connectivity scenarios. Um, expect errors in retries. In multi-cloud, we have um, we have noticed that they are more prevalent. So make sure you design your services with this in mind. And remember to go cloud agnostic, first of all, but also push as much work to specialized services as possible and rely on the public cloud vendor while avoiding lock-in. So you see the new, this is the new stack after multi-cloud. So we run our payment, our Go payment services with the managed Kubernetes offering of each cloud vendor. Um, we use Nat's Jetstream as our event bus, which runs on multi-cloud. And we use CockroachDB as our distributed SQL storage. Um, we haven't changed anything on the other side, on the uh, to, on the data center side, but we might. Um, there is a project ongoing to um, uh, replace NAT streaming with NAT Jetstream, as that is being deprecated. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to check out our podcast and our engineering site, as well as our Twitter account. Um, there. We have so many, we're very proud to say that we have a lot of engineers for form, from Form 3 at KubeCon. So do come to our stand in Pavilion 1 and we can chat more about multi-cloud and um, yeah, just like in, embrace the community feeling of this conference. Thank you. All right. Oh, check, check. All right. Uh, Thanks for great presentation, Alina. So we got a, a, f a few more minutes uh, for the question. If you have any question, I'm going to pass the mic to on. So please uh, uh, don't hesitate, hand you up. And then, OK, so any question? Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, you said that 
the client can choose on which cl cloud he wants to run on. Is it also possible that one client, like he says, it doesn't matter and there are multiple clouds working for him or does he ha actually has to choose one? So um, I may have phrased, so the question was whether um, the, about how our clients choose where, where they connect to, to which cloud provider they connect. So our clients have high availability connections to all of our cloud providers so they can connect on any payment service and then they can choose exactly which one to connect to. They don't have to um, like only connect to one and then you, that's the one you've got. Um, and then, yeah, if, if there is an outage, then they can go and connect to the other provider. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I want to ask, how do you handle um, private keys and key sharing and secrets across multiple clouds, is that something you have solved as well? So that, that's an excellent question. The question is about how we secure connections uh, in multi-cloud. Um, so all of the connections in between the clouds are secure, um, but I'm not a security expert. We'll be happy to tell you more about exactly how our client, how the client side security works um, if you come to our stand. Thank you. All right. Uh, any questions? We have, by the way, the mic in the center, so you can just step up and then ask any questions. All right. I think it's a really good uh, presentation, and you already uh, explained a lot of stuff, and then people already understand. Okay, uh, thanks again. Thanks for great presentation of Lena today. And then thanks for uh, attending this session and hope you enjoy the rest of the QCon. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone.